And hello everyone, thank you for joining us for 15 minutes. My guest today in the studio is King County Councilman Rod Dembowski representing the 1st District. Councilman Dembowski, thanks for being with us today. Happy to be here. How are you doing? Couldn't be better. You're a local kid. You grew up in unincorporated uh, King County, went to Hazen High School, yep. raised uh, by a single father with a brother. I would imagine that probably taught you a lot of self-reliance growing up. How was it growing up for you? Well, uh, it was it was good. It wasn't always uh, easy, and uh, I think like a lot of people, uh, you learn life's lessons and take those into adulthood and hopefully put them into practice. But uh, it was raised by my dad, Al, Korean War vet. Uh, he was a small business owner, had a store in Kent for a while, then closed that, and uh, ended up making most of our living selling socks out at the Midway Swap Meet, and I was there just about every weekend as a kid with my brother. I had a feeling academics in high school was something that was important to you. Is that, is that right? Very. Uh, high school was a place where I could go and uh, have a supportive environment and ended up doing okay there. What other things did you do in high school aside from studying? Well, um, I, you know, studied I know obviously. you like cars. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyed cars. My brother was more the car guy, um, uh, but a lot of student government. Uh, got involved in student government and really took a liking to that and kind of uh, that was a lot of good life's lessons there. Yeah, it, reading your bio, it seemed that you did have an early interest in government and politics. You decided to further your education at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Why did you decide on, to go to Georgetown? Well, um, you know, a lot of reasons. I, I was interested in, in politics and government and uh, thought that Washington, D.C. would be, you know, a good place to do that. I applied to four schools, two local and, and two in Washington, and I never visited Georgetown. and. Uh, got in and uh, with a lot of local support from folks here, uh, Georgetown alumni in particular, they interview every applicant and still do to this day and I participated in that program after I graduated. But I uh, went to Georgetown and, and really enjoyed that experience. I was very fortunate to be able to go there. Uh, and for a poor kid from Renton, it was an eye-opener. You know, when we spoke before, you had mentioned that your grandfather worked at the Bremerton Shipyard. That's something that we have in common. My grandfather also moved, worked at the Bremerton Shipyard for a number of years. Uh, when he moved from Minnesota. Uh, did, did you know your grandfather very well? I didn't know him at all. He passed away before I was born, but he was a 50-year journeyman boilermaker, uh, worked in the steam locomotives and the lumber camps, and, and in that kind of work, you go where the work is. Uh, they uh, were in Oregon, but during the war, there was a lot of work up at the Bremerton Naval Shipyards. Right. He worked there, worked on a British ship called the War Spite that was damaged uh, in the war and, and came in, and my dad still tells a story uh, as going, going to visit him as a little kid, and. Uh, actually seeing uh, kind of wounded, not wounded, but dead sailors uh, in, in the war spite uh, and coming mm. out. And still has kind of a medallion from that. So he worked there and, and uh, that was some of the last work uh, he did. He got sick, you know, working in those boilers. He right. got black lung uh, and ultimately uh, that killed him. You, when you worked in, or when you uh, lived in Washington, D.C., again, your, your interest in politics probably did nothing but grow at that point. You, at some point, actually interned at the White House, yeah. I understand. Is that right? Yeah, when I was, was there from 90 to 94, uh, this uh, unknown governor from Arkansas named Bill Clinton decided to run for president. Not many had <laughs> at the time. And uh, he was a Georgetown uh, alum. So we formed a group, a friend of mine, uh, called Georgetown Students for Clinton. Uh, took bus trips up to New Hampshire, doorbell for him up there in the primary. And the real grassroots. Yeah, sort. and he came to Georgetown and gave three speeches, three policy speeches, uh, domestic policy and foreign policy among them, and we participated in kind of hosting those. And uh, ultimately, when he was elected, uh, I was able to serve uh, in the White House as an intern my last year at Georgetown. At some point, you decided that you wanted to go to law school, and you came home and went to the University of Washington. Why did you want to go to law school? Well, it took a few years. I came home and worked a couple years for then County Executive Gary Locke uh, here in the courthouse. Uh, that was my first job. Uh, and then two years for a company called Pat Car Financial, and they financed Kenworth and Peterbilt trucks. Uh, and decided that probably wasn't what I was interested in doing for a long time, and from there went to law school uh, at the University of Washington. You did some policy work, you're sort of a policy analyst for, for uh, Executive Block at that time. Yes. That must have, again, really stimulated your interest uh, in local politics, uh, wanting to work in local politics, the county, the city, the local level, that type of thing. Well, it was a really exciting opportunity. Uh, growth management was just coming into play. There were a lot of issues here at King County about what the future was going to look like. Were we going to continue to pave over and grow? Um, residential subdivisions and commercial uh, mm -hmm. properties up into the foothills, or where were we going to draw a line and concentrate growth in our urban areas and our infrastructure like transit and uh, wastewater and things like that? 
And uh, that was the big issue uh, during right. that time, and it was a neat opportunity to be a part of that. I'll bet it was, and, and I, I know Gary Locke, and I know the man can literally fix anything. <laughs> I think he actually still carries his toolkit around with him, but any car machine, he can literally fix anything. He was well known for changing <laughs> his own oil, and I spent a lot of time with him in his uh, Honda station wagon, <laughs> driving around the county. Really got to see the county uh, up front and personally. It's changed a, a lot since then. We've had tremendous growth. Uh, we're now over two million people here in King County, one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. Uh, and it's a good time to be in King County. You represent the first district, uh, parts of Kirkland, Kenmore, Woodenville, uh, North Seattle, a lot of exciting things going on uh, up there in the Bothell area and in the Woodenville area. The winery industry has just exploded up there. It really has. Um, you'd be surprised, but we have, I think, well over a million visitors a year mm. come to Woodenville wine country. Uh, and King County plays an important role there. Uh, because we are the local government and have an agricultural protection district in that area, which is uh, kind of the beautiful vision you see there in that uh, Sammamish River Valley. Um, and it's, there's some tension and some pressure as the industry grows. We've got distilleries, we've got breweries, and we want to make sure that we keep what's good and allow um, those businesses to kind of flourish. Seems like you have to achieve the balance because, as you said, you have the growers up there, you have the wineries, but at the same time, you want people to be able to travel there and enjoy their stay there. So it's probably just, as, as usual, it's trying to achieve that balance between the interests. That's exactly right. What kind of infrastructure is provided? What kind of regulatory environment is there? Uh, how can we support that growing industry while not ruining uh, what draws people to the valley, which is the beautiful scenery? After law school, you actually went into civil practice uh, with a, a, a law firm, uh, Foster Pepper. Uh, you worked in the, in the, in the, in the uh, I think, the regulatory field, uh, dealing with clients who were local governments. Uh, that was part of my practice, yeah. I was a civil litigator. I tried cases as often as I could. Uh, a lot of real estate work. Uh, the firm had a very strong and has a very strong real estate practice, and I really enjoyed that work, but also represented governments. I was a special deputy prosecuting attorney uh, for King County and, and other municipal governments uh, and enjoyed uh, that bit of work. How long were you at Foster Pepper? For? Almost 12 years, and uh, I was uh, promoted to be an equity partner, which is kind of the gold standard mm -hmm. if you're a lawyer, and um, I really enjoyed it. It was a special place. I went there because that firm in particular had uh, a reputation for encouraging its lawyers to be involved in the community and in civic projects, and uh, that was an appealing thing about practicing law. You could uh, participate in the community uh, and make a decent living, but also uh, give back. So, Councilman, you had a successful civil career going. Uh, at some point, the seat opened up uh, for, the, uh, for the first district. You were appointed to that seat. Why did you decide then to kind of give up your career in law and then become an elected official? Well, that was not an easy decision. Um, I was set, if you will, and um, very comfortable, which uh, coming from my background, that was an important thing to me, uh, to be economically secure and, and had a young family. Uh, and so that took a lot of thought, uh, but I thought if I ever wanted to give back to the community and serve the community on a full-time basis, uh, those opportunities don't come along very often. And so I thought I would uh, throw my hat into the ring along with, uh, I don't know, there were at least a dozen others that sought right. the appointment. Uh, the county executive sent Some other elected officials, over. I understand, as well. Correct, yeah. And the uh, county executive sent three, three names over, and I was ultimately appointed to fill the remainder of the term that Bob Ferguson vacated when he was elected attorney general and then I ran for election <clears throat> in the fall of 13 and was elected. So being an elected official, uh, you not only are have an extremely busy schedule during the day, but you also have uh, community meetings at night, meetings with stakeholders, so it really doesn't stop at five when you're a local elected official, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, an emphatic um, no. <laughs> uh, in private practice, uh, we were on call for our clients 24-7. Uh, my phone number was in the phone book. They're on vacation. You're still available mm. to client responsive. Uh, and so the nature of that kind of part of this work, being responsive to constituents who are essentially my clients today, uh, that's okay. That's, that's part of something I'm used to doing and enjoy doing very much. Let me talk about an issue that you've been championing. And that is untested rape kits. When a crime is committed uh, and there is a victim and evidence is collected, semen, hair, blood, urine, uh, those pieces of evidence are collected 
uh, and sent to the uh, toxicology lab for analysis. But not all of these pieces of evidence are analyzed, especially if they haven't uh, caught a suspect. You championed some funding to have all of these untested rape kits uh, tested. Yes. Tell me about that. So nationwide, uh, there is a tremendous um, backlog of untested sexual assault kits around the country. And what we have found is when you actually process uh, these kits and collect the DNA and get it into the national crime database, you catch bad people uh, because they've shown up and a number of crimes have been solved, including here locally uh, down in Pierce County, uh, where somebody who had uh, kidnapped and assaulted a young child, uh, but they had never found him and had never been convicted of that, was found and convicted of another life sentence. Uh -huh. Here in King County, we had in our evidence locker about 400 of these kits. Uh, and when a victim goes through this process, it's tremendously invasive. It's a multi-hour process. It's very intrusive. It's uh, traumatic. Uh, and there's a notion of justice in wanting to complete the work to have the kit tested. Now, the 400 kits in our evidence locker uh, were not tested for a reason. Maybe there was a conviction already. Uh, maybe they didn't need it. Maybe there was a, a lack of desire to prosecute. <clears throat> So that it's not like that they did not get the attention that, that they needed at the time, but <clears throat> this notion of the secondary benefit of when you test these and finding bad guys has really uh, come into to the fore. So we uh, appropriated here a couple hundred thousand dollars to take a look at our kits and make sure they're all tested. It's consistent with a new statewide law championed by uh, Tina Orwall, the state mm. representative out of South King County, where on a going forward basis now, the state law will require that every kit be tested and we're doing some work, and the King County is part of that, on what we do with the backlog of untested kits. It's my hope that we test them all, because I think it's going to lead to positive results. Has the backlog the result primarily of, of lack of funding, or investigators simply don't need that evidence at that time? Around the country, it's been, I think, a lack of funding uh, to a large degree. Here in King County, I think our, our, our particular story has been it wasn't deemed necessary by the detective at the time. So we've done a pretty right. good job. Um, and the, I think the benefits we're going to see by testing these 400 kits um, are going to lead to some additional convictions and knowledge and also a sense of fulfillment and justice for the person who went through the traumatic experience. I went to Harborview, talked mm -hmm. to the nurses. We have one of the best sexual assault clinics in the country at Harborview Hospital, which King County owns. Um, and when you learn about that and hear about that, it's a pretty compelling uh, series of, or, or set of information. And wants, it, it really compels you to act. On another issue we've been hearing in the national news about thousands of refugees coming from different countries, Syria for one, coming to different countries to uh, escape persecution. You've been studying this issue and have championed this issue along with some other representatives about how does King County better prepare uh, for refugees who come and, and seek some sort of asylum or simply a new life uh, here in the United States, specifically King County. Uh, that's an issue that you've been championing and studying. Tell me about, tell me about that, if you could. Well, Washington State in particular, from uh, the time of uh, Governor Dan Evans, when we had people in Southeast Asia uh, who were refugees, uh, has long been a welcoming community for refugees from around the world. And today, I think the statistic in King County is more than 40% of our residents today were not uh, born in the United States or not born here. Uh, so our refugee and immigrant community is tremendously large and really a powerful force in the growth of King County and its economic success and its cultural vibrancy. The thing we're trying to do uh, with our task force to look at our refugee and immigrant commission is say, how can King County make sure that we're being responsive to this new population and these populations with respect to, in particular to refugees who may need a little extra help? We want to be sensitive to that. Everyone in the county doesn't look like me. In fact, fewer and fewer people do. Uh, and so we're trying to put the lens on uh, of county government services to make sure that we are being responsive to and supportive of those organizations. So we put together a task force, uh, and it's going to look to determine whether or not we should have an office and a commission for uh, immigrant and refugee affairs. On a more general question, yeah. we've certainly been hearing, at least nationally, at the national level, that there is simply a very large level of frustration among elected officials, at the, again, at the, primarily at the national level. As an elected official, do you hear that some level of frustration from your constituents, or what are you hearing from your constituents in terms of uh, any level of frustration that they have toward elected officials? Again, primarily at the national level, but what are you hearing out there? 
You know, people do get frustrated. Um, most folks are trying to get to work uh, or get to a doctor's appointment, raise their families, enjoy this great community we have, uh, and they want to see government work. Mm -hmm. And King County, I have to tell you, nine times out of 10, helps this region succeed. It helps us move. We have the Metro Transit Division. That's our largest division. We move 120 million boardings a year. Without that function, we don't work. We've cleaned up the water, right? Jim Ellis's vision of being able to swim in, swim in Lake mm -hmm. Washington. Uh, Metro did that, and that's part of King County now. So people are frustrated, and I think one thing I'd like to convey is uh, certain times you should be frustrated. I get frustrated with King County government. <laughs> Frankly, I view one of my roles here as being an overseer and, and, and holding the bureaucracy to account and to remember who we work for, and that's our taxpayers and our residents. Uh, and sometimes, you, you know, you need to ask tough questions and drill down on the bureaucracy to do that. Uh, so, yeah, I think people are frustrated. I think the good story here is that local government is not gridlocked like Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. We work very well here across, uh, we're nonpartisan, but folks have partisan leanings. We work across the aisle, we get stuff done, uh, and we are responsive to our local residents. I think in, a, in a, nine times out of ten in a pretty good way. King County Councilman Rod Dombowski, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Enjoy. And thank you for joining us, everyone. We hope you'll join us again for another 15 minutes. We'll see you soon.